Welcome to Wizards of the Tower. Roleplay, Episode 9. Of Campaign Tales. Welcome to Wizards of the Tower. Roleplay. Campaign Tales. Episode, episode nine. 9. So when last we left the party, they were at the 25th of Budding Fin. Budding no, it was actually the 31st of Budding Fin. It was 31st of Budding Fin, yeah. Which is May in my world. Yeah. And we were missing a party member, uh, our cleric of Morte, who eventually caught up with us that day. Yeah. And that's Brigid. Yeah, Brigid, who Brigid, is, is played by Lauren, had not been able to make... The session, yeah, and so we had to write them out for a session. I didn't have their character sheet, so couldn't couldn't play Lauren's character, and they were left behind uh, outside of a village. They'd been lost yeah. in a snowstorm, but and, they eventually caught up. And Brigid had had gotten to the village and decided to head out on her own, and had passed the the, the chaos tree because they were in a hurry. They thought, oh, that's that's something kind of interesting. I'll have to visit. I've, I've heard of this place before, but I've never visited it. Yeah. And I'll have to visit it some other time. So, uh, Brigid catches up to the party just as the party is building a camp. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what happens then, of course, if the next day, the first to fan with, is we encounter a battle scene. Well, actually, that night, uh, Brigid, who knows Rolf, uh, when uh, Brigid comes into the camp and... So, sees Rolf, comes to the realization that Rolf oh, yes. is the son of Invernia, yeah. the goddess of winter. Now, the thing is, in my realm, Invernia is the daughter of Morte, the daughter god of, of death. Yeah. And Brigid is a goddess, or, or not a goddess, a, a cleric. cleric of Morte. Yeah. And so, Brigid, this leads to an awkward moment when all of a sudden Brigid realizes, oh my gosh, he's a demigod. Not only that, but I should be paying homage to him. Because, you know, I'm a cleric of Morte. Invernia is Morte's daughter. Essentially, I should be paying homage to this demigod. He is the bastard son of Invernia. Oh, look, I should have been, you know, worshipping him all yeah. this time. So it's quite quite the role play there. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a like an awkward situation and Bergen really doesn't know how to react. Uh, just kinda like how we all don't know really how to act how to react, yeah. you know, during this situation. Yeah. So the first of fan with, which is basically June. Yeah. in my world. And Fanwith was another one of those, I think, that we, we kind of brainstormed together. It's like, well, the, the time is getting hotter, yeah. and you fan yourself. And yeah. I think we even took a, an old word which uh, which meant hot or something. I can't remember what it was, but I remember that's part of how we came up with the name of Fanwith. It's kind of a derivative of, of Fanwith, and we kind of, or something like that. We kind of changed it slightly to make it June, where it's starting to get hotter. Right. So the party comes across a bunch of frozen dead people. Yeah, it's a battle scene, obviously, yeah. and everybody's just... Or a massacre. A massacre, and they're all smashed to the ground and contorted in all these positions and Looks frozen. Looks horror on their face. And their eyes are stretched out and their mouths are, uh, you know, frozen like that, that they're, you know, they're frozen in, in these postures of, of complete horror and fear. And there's 20 bodies, yep. but one of them is actually not dead. One of them's still alive. Right. One yeah. of them, and this is a new player that we had joining our group, yep. uh, Thomas. Yeah. And Thomas is playing a witch named... Maddock. Maddock. Or Madoc, Ma sometimes we call it, but really it's supposed to be Maddock. Maddock is actually from the Snowcat Clan, the yeah. to the east of Hollystaff. And the Snowcat Clan are actually enemies to the Hollystaff Clan. Yeah. Now, Maddock comes up with a story that they were traitors looking for to trade food and whatever else mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, Fruby Lansby village yeah, and, and, Holly uh, Hall, and Holly staff. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is is they were actually a raiding party. Yeah. They I, were looking they were gonna they were looking for food and they were gonna go there and try and get food and possibly some slaves and then go back and uh, celebrate. But what happened to them is they actually got jumped by giants. And smashed. And smashed and killed. And, and Maddox was the only survivor. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that our party doesn't pick up on the fact that this trading group 
doesn't have a whole lot of trade goods <laughs> with them, but they've got a lot of weapons. So actually, these giants did all the Hollystaff people a favor by killing this this raiding group, because otherwise they would have wreaked havoc through the Hollystaff lands. Like you said, taking food, taking resources, yeah. taking weapons, taking slaves, killing people. Uh, it would, you know, it, it's just like a guerrilla warfare operation. And so the giants, as bad as the giants are, actually saved the Hollystaff people uh, from this group. And then, of course, Maddock is able to convince us that, oh, we were simple traders, uh, you know, traveling down, looking for food. And, you know, the kind of the fools that we are, we absorb Maddock into our group as we're traveling on. And we don't think anything's amiss, you know, yeah, but uh, that's kind of what happens. And Maddock is an unusual aspect because typically there aren't male witches yeah. in male my witch. world. They're typically females. Yeah. And Maddock is, is a rarity mm -hmm. as a male witch. Yeah. And Maddock has a little bird called Grillo. Grillo, a little Grillo thrush. thrush. That's kind of a, a little magical companion that can fly around and, and carry spells and observe things for him. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, magic users a lot of times they have these little animal companions yeah, that help them familiar. Out. Now with a witch, a witch, uh, their, their familiar actually grants them their spells through mm -hmm. their patron, who their patron they don't know who that is. Yeah. And Maddock does not know who the patron that they follow is. But uh, they get their power from Grillo. Yeah. So um, that night, um, you know, of course, we have our cleric of Morte now with us. And we have our other cleric. And so we gather up all the bodies and build a giant pier. You know, that's what they do in the Northlands. They burn the bodies. That's to prevent them from rising. As they undead. do that in the South, too, and yeah. in the Sador and many other But they, they do that to build, you know, they build piers so that the, the dead won't rise again. That's probably something left over from the wars before. It's actually, it predates that, but yeah. uh, not everyone did it. Now everybody does it. Yeah. It's the proper thing common. to see, to do, to to uh, to cast the spirit and, and its ashes and, and bodily into uh, the, the world, into yeah. the, the land. And, and yeah. so that way they can be reborn again. So that night, as we have the big uh, pier uh, burning... Uh, something's attracted by it, and we get attacked by what we consider to be a small dragon. Yeah, it's actually a, a wyvern. Yeah. Which comes in when they're sleeping, attacks, and grabs their cleric Yursa. Yeah, their grabs cleric Yursa. of of uh, Use. Yeah. And is trying to make off with, with uh, Yursa. Yeah, uh, has it in her claws. Uh, you know, uh, has her in its claws. It's trying to flap away. And it's just by the narrowest of margins that we're able to attack it and prevent it from flying away with it. Yeah, Maddock, witches have what they call hexes in 1st edition Pathfinder. Yeah. They have 2nd edition, they have it as well. But one of the, the hexes that uh, witches can have in 1st edition Pathfinder is the slumber. And yeah. the slumber is a very powerful hex in many mm -hmm. ways because it will affect anything that can be, including elves. Yeah. It won't affect undead because undead don't sleep, but it will affect elves and other some other creatures which can be affected by sleep, and it's it, it's not uh, hit dice based like uh, a sleep spell. It slumber is it? No. So a sleep spell will hit up to four hit die of okay. creature. So if you have one one creature that's four hit dice, it could put that to sleep. Or if you have four four hit dice creatures, it'll put one of them, could put one of them to sleep. Or if you have four or six first level one hit die creatures, it can put four of them, up to four of them asleep. So how do, so being a hex, is the save different uh, on a hex at, from a spell? It's it's similar to a save that the spell has, uh -huh. being that it's it's based upon your level and your abilities, so that can go up and down. Okay. So, and the higher level you are, the harder it becomes to, to, uh, to avoid it. Okay. And then the higher, I think it might be intelligence based. The higher your intelligence is, the harder it becomes to, uh, to avoid it. See, I'm not quite sure. I've never played a witch, so I'm not quite sure exactly how hexes work. Uh, but I know that witches can be very potent in battle because they can mind affect uh, creatures and and other people. So you could have a very powerful being. 
you know, a dragon, mm-hmm. dragon, not a dragon, but like a dragon L or something like that, or some kind of a Well, troll. it can actually affect a dragon or a troll. Oh, there you the go. thing is, a witch's hex can only, you, you, you cast it, and you have to be within 30 feet. So basically, you give them, give them the eye. And the eye, giving them the eye, or looking at something, you don't touch them, but you mm-hmm. have to be within 30 feet. Okay. You can affect one creature. Now, you can only affect, try and affect that creature one time unless you've got another hex spell or hex, which allows you to try and, and I th- can't remember which one it is, but uh, you can try and recast it again if you have that hex, but if you don't, then you can only do it one time. I gotcha. And witches can also have healing, and yeah. they, can, they can affect, so if you have eight people in your party, you can heal each person one time yeah. in the party f- per 24 hours. That's the way the slumber works, is, is it can try and affect a creature one time per 24 hours. And if it fails at saving throw, it falls asleep. Okay. And in this case, Maddock uses the Hex slumber spell on the Wyvern, and it falls asleep. It falls asleep. So it, may, it rolls a one on its saving throw. Yeah, so luckily then we're able to get our Cleric out of its claws, and then we coup de gras it. Uh, but one of the advantages of having a big, a big dead wyvern right there is it's over 2,000 pounds of meat. So we're able to harvest a tremendous amount of lizard meat from this animal. And also we take its claws and teeth and make little fetish necklaces and stuff that we wear, which is really kind of cool because we like to adorn ourselves and things like yeah. that. But we gather a huge amount of meat, which makes it so that we don't have to hunt every day and forage so much for right. food. And then that got into exactly how much meat could we possibly carry in our packs. You know, it's weird in the D&D world because, you know, you can carry 100 pounds or something. But then part of that is also your armor. Right. And it's, it's your weapons. How much mobility you have, whether it takes you from 30 feet down to 20. Now, your movement from 30 feet to 20, even to 10, to slow movement, to difficult movement, depending on how much weight you have. So we had to work out exactly how many pounds of meat we could carry. And then our meat consumption, we had to work out how much meat we would consume a day. Which is kind of interesting, because I'm going to do a shout out to Bob the World Builder, who's actually got a couple videos on food and adventuring eating. And what they say in the rule book is actually kind of, yeah, you know, based upon, you know, real world. And I try to make my, my adventures more real world. Yeah. You know, eating a pound of, of food a day really is not enough to That's sustain no. an adventure, especially... Especially if it's freezing cold out, you yeah. need more meat, and you're walking 10 to 20 miles a day, which, you know, that's a long way to walk. Yeah. You're carrying all of this gear, you're humping it like, like an army. Yeah. You know, an army person's not going to eat just a pound of food a day. No. You know, carrying their weapons, carrying their rucksack, and, and fighting, and the stress, and everything yeah. else. And uh, it's it's some fun videos that Bob has on that, on how much food, and, and I know he... On the first one, he had, he was struggling, and the second one, he was doing better. But he yeah. wasn't doing as much activities. Well, so, so, I mean, here's the thing. So when we tried to figure out exactly, like, how, or roughly how much food we'd be consuming, I remember from reading Undaunted Courage, which is a Stephen Ambrose book about Lewis and Clark, where they ate seven to eight pounds of meat a day uh, because they were, you know, fo- they were portaging their boats. They were flat boating up the river in the Missouri uh, they were, you know, moving, you know, a large, you know, through these tracts of land. They were, you know, constructing um, camps as they went. So seven or eight pounds of meat a day. And they know this because they found their latrine pits and dug through them and calculated how much fecal matter the guys left behind and realized that they have ate a tremendous amount of, of fresh meat every day. So if you can imagine our party, mm-hmm. you know, doing some of the same things they're doing, foraging, hiking through rough terrain, hunting, fighting, whatever, they would probably eat the same amount. So if you could carry 60 pounds of wyvern meat in your pack, you'd be consuming 7 to 8 pounds of that every day. So that, that And then have a bear to feed, too. And then have a bear, because the bear eats twice as much as everyone else. So we have to you know pool our meat to feed the bear, to, to feed Sophie. So you end up having, you know from the wyvern, you end up having enough food for maybe 8 to nine days, which yeah. really helps us out quite a bit. But the thing is, is we have to, you know, calculate, you know, our movement speed, how much we can carry in our backpacks, what else we're doing, you know, what we're else trudging we're trudging through, we're trudging you know, through snow, two to three feet deep snow. Yeah, 
And so it ends up being kind of a slog. Yeah, and there's a great show on that we like to watch called Alone, which gets into you know people starving to death because they don't have yeah. enough food to eat yeah, and what protein. you know trying to trying to you know maintain uh, cutting wood and get gathering getting water exactly and trying to gather what food they can and trying to stay warm and yeah. and maintain their shelter and and everything else so yeah. you know it's it's you know I try to keep it more real world even though it's a fantasy role sure. playing game I try to try try to make it a little bit more real world so. They have to have enough food, and the Wavern supplies food for, for a little while. Yeah. Uh, so it continues on, our adventure continues, and then the second of Fanwith, we uh, encounter some old ruins that are along the... Remember, we're moving up the valley, you know, along this river. We're moving up the valley, and there's steep valley sides. Well, <clears throat> built into the side of the valley is like an old fortress or some old yeah, this fortified crumbling village down. that's crumbling down, and we encounter... Uh, that fortress, and as we go to investigate, well, we find someone there. Now, this actually was another random encounter with the deck of cards. And like I said, I, I have a chart, and it came up that we pulled from the cards. So, once again, we had uh, the party roll off. The lowest person had to pick the card and or the, and the deck, yeah. and it came down that it was a ruin of an old fort or castle. Well, there's no castles up here. So, it's an old fort or an old village. It's falling down. It's yeah. been abandoned a very long time. Uh, it's closer to the Snowcat territory. It might have been raided a long time ago, and it's just gone, you know, faded away. Yeah. And they actually find smoke coming from the runes, and as they investigate, they find that there is a dwarf who has taken a bunch of the materials and rebuilt a shelter. Yeah, kind of a hut that right. he's staying in. And he ended up being there through some circumstances, which are... Yeah, he was a trader who'd been traveling through the lands, and that's what he does. And he had an elk that pulled his sled, and his elk had fallen, broken its leg, and he didn't have the means of curing it, and it died, so he's been eating on his elk. And he's got this sled that's piled full of, of trade goods, mm -hmm. And one of the trade goods that he has is something in my realm called Mithril Axe Stout. Stout. And Mithril Axe Stout is a legend in my yeah, game. Yeah. It's a dwarven drink, a dwarven ale, it's or, a dwarven stout ale or stout. That is, yeah. that it's is a stout, really. Thick and black and is enough to knock a non dwarf yeah. right off their feet yeah. after just drinking a little bit of it. It is powerful. And I mean, it's legendary in its potency. And when you drink it, of course, you don't want to turn it down because someone offers it to you. And you're Especially like, oh. a dwarf. Yeah, you're like, oh, dwarven ale. I can't say no because I don't want to anger this guy. You know, he may think, you know, we're inhospitable. Uh, he's being hospitable by, you know, offering you. You don't want to be, you know, uh, you don't want to be, you know, the kind of person who refuses his hospitality. So you take a sip of, of Mithralax Stout and you got to make a save. Right. A rather and... a big save, actually. <laughs> right. It's a 16 fortitude save for the first drink. Yeah. For the very first drink. Now, dwarves don't actually have to start making that until after they've had five or, or more. Yeah. Then they have to start. And, but their save is actually lower. Now, Mithralax Stout is actually made from mushrooms that are grown underground yep. in the dwarven kingdoms. That's just one of their ingredients. So it's it's got this very potent, almost... Um, Mind-altering, hallucinogenic, <laughs> hallucinogenic <laughs> effect to you. Yeah. And if you fail your save, you are out cold. Yeah. And you are out cold for for a while. I mean, literally, people will take a, a a glass of it, tip it back, taste it, and just keep going back, and just lay flat out on their back. And uh, you fail your save, you're just poof, on your back. And that's how fast it acts, and that's how much, and you know, that's how far you go. Yeah, that's how how uh, far into unconscious bliss that you go. Now, the name Mithralax Stout. Once you wake up from it, you feel like you've had a Mithralax X embedded into your skull. Yeah, you um, you you take you are sickened. You're so you actually have the sickened condition, which. Uh, sickened means that you're what negative two on all saves. Yeah, all you don't want to move. You don't want to. Yeah, you you're in a bad condition. So, what ends up happening is Karnak, of course, has 
uh, some Mithralax Stout. And Karnak's they, fine. Yeah, affected. Karnak's fine, and they're chatting all night long, but most of us who drink it end up flat on our backs <gasps> and in the sickened condition the next day. So it ends up being really bad is that during the third day of fan with, we just basically hang out with with uh, Thunder and Amberhorn, tell stories and try to recover, you know, with the most monstrous hangover we've ever had. It being young kids, you know, not, you know, used to drinking some meat or drinking some tough ale or whatever. We're not used to drinking this kind of stout. And we're just basically sitting around the campfire the next day trying to recover. Young kids. Right. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to recover the whole next day. That's the third of fan with. Yeah. So Mithralax Stout is quite the the fun thing within in yeah. my realms that people like to, to drink. And yeah. as soon as they brought it up, Mithralax Stout, you tell them just like, oh no. <laughs> it <laughs> just turn it down. Can't turn it down, but man, you gotta watch what you drink because it is so potent. Yeah, and and if you make your save of sixteen on the first one, then it goes up to eighteen. Yeah. Then it goes up to twenty, yeah. and then it goes up to twenty-two. Yeah. And then it goes up to twenty-four. And one adventure, they actually had a wizard who actually I downed five of them, but yeah. he did not want to move for yeah. for a couple of days. Now, so in the past when we've run across stuff like this, we always used to have a character. You had some characters. Shadow, our thief, played by uh, a person who was in our group, who we're not going to mention. Uh, was always one of the ones where he was like, okay, yeah, I want to drown to get in a drinking contest with this dwarf. And all of us would just start laughing. It's like, yeah, okay, man, you know, you start rolling. And eventually, you know, he would almost inevitably make his first save. First or second save. Yeah, but then it would get rough and he would fail his third save. Yeah. And then Delaney would be like, well, not only are you sickened, you're near, you're, you're, Near death. <laughs> well, you're not really death, but you, you, you wish you were. Yeah, you wish you were. You feel you like are, you got that dwarven mithril axe. Yeah, you are in, in such forehead. you're in such a condition that you are not able to move yeah. the next day. Anybody who's ever woken up with a really bad hangover, yeah. imagine that about ten times over. Ten times over. I mean, this stuff is powerful. So for the third of fan with, we do nothing. But then on the fourth, we eventually get ourselves together and we leave. Um, no, no. Actually, they they tell the dwarf Thundred about this uh, corn that they're going to go visit. And oh yeah, that's, that's what one thing does we he do. tell you? Well, uh, Thundred, of course, uh, you know, is a he's an aged dwarf, and he's got a lot of experience in traveling and everything. And he basically makes a prediction, and he says to us, he says, "Look, you, if you go to those places, you're only going to find death. That's it. Yeah. You're just you're only going to find death in those places." And of course, being adventurers like we are, we don't really we don't really pay any attention. We're like, oh, death, death. Why well, laugh in the face of death? Ha ha. We don't really say can't that. be that bad. We don't really say that, but we're almost like, wow, it can't be that bad. I mean, we've encountered all this stuff before. Uh, it's a little bit of foreshadowing to what's going to happen, and of course, we're not going to exactly tell you right now exactly what happens. You'll have to find out, you know, what happens later. But we. We take his advice. We're like, okay, all right. And, of course, he, he stays at his camp, uh, you know, and uh, works on his sled. Oh, he does offer to, to, to buy the bear. Or trade oh, for that's the bear. right. He offers, he offers to buy Sophie from us. But because Sophie's an animal companion, we can't do that. But I think we're going to figure out a way to rig it so that Sophie can pull his sled. Yeah, you actually make a deal that if when you come back, yeah. uh, the, the, you guys will help him get to where he's going and have Sophie pull yeah, because I think we, you we do come across that agreement. Yeah, I mean, we calculate he would give you some things for it. Yeah, we calculate the amount of weight that's on his sled and figure out by using the D and D rules that Sophie is a dun bear, of course, but essentially being a grizzly bear has enough strength to pull the sledge. Yeah. So anyway, we but we don't do that now. We head we keep heading up the valley, uh, and that's on the fourth when we head up uh, towards the mound. And this mound is different than this mound, right? The one we yeah, encounter. you get to the mound, and the mound is actually all snow. Yeah. And it only has one big giant stone right in the middle of it. A real big, huge, giant stone. Yeah, a giant tor that sticks out of this top yeah. of this hill. And as soon as we get there, we're confronted by... A giant? A giant. And a goblin. A goblin now, imp that sits on its shoulder like yeah. this. Now, the place actually has a name, which the party has never... I'm going to give it out here. It's called uh, uh, Judder Dump, which in... Uh, a language that I actually translated and moved a few words around means giant's thumb. Oh, okay. Because it's like a giant's thumb sticking out of the Sticking rock. up out of the, out of the hill. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. You didn't yeah. bring that up nope. then. Nope, I never did because nobody knows that. But 
That's actually the name of the place is Jutterdome. Well, okay, so now giant as a language. Now remember we've talked about giant. Giant as a language is so complex that it takes up two language, right. language slots in Pathfinder. Normally, you know, depending on how intelligent you are in Pathfinder, you get these language slots. And people usually take like orc, if dwarf, orc's your enemy, or elvish. dwarf, or elvish, or halfling, or gnome, or something like that. And you get, depending how intelligent you are, you get three or four, sometimes only two, if you're, you know, sometimes not very intelligent. One. Yeah, you get a couple language slots. But giant, because it is so complex, takes up two language slots. So almost no one has that, because right. no one's willing to do that. And no one can actually start off a giant in my world. You actually you have, have to... Learn to Somebody has to teach it to you, or you have to find the yeah. books and use magic to translate, or the yeah. scrolls that actually have the giant to learn it, yeah, to yeah. learn how to at least speak it. Now, that's not learning how to read and write it. That's yeah, just speaking, just speaking it. it. Yeah, so it's complex. So what happens is when we see this giant, I mean, we would never even know the place is called Giant's Thumb, and no. we, but we see a giant there. And the giant has a little goblin imp on its shoulder who seems to be sort of whispering in its ear. And the giant is enormous and it throws rocks. Yeah. And so we're guessing at this time that it's a, a, a hill giant. Hill giant or stone giant? Or stone giant. Yeah. Yeah. So combat ensues is what happens. Well, you try to, the, the giant comes charging up and is ready to attack, and you start negotiating with the giant. Yeah. Well, it, it tells you some. It tells us some things, but it, it speaks in giant, yeah. right? Yeah. And so uh, Karnak is the only one who's able to really kind of even make sense. Not even, not even Karnak. But I think one of your spellcasters, it might have been Matic actually, or Brigid, does a comprehend languages. Com Somebody does a comprehend languages to understand what the giant's saying. But they don't have tongues, so they can't right. reply. And so right. it's kind of weird. I mean, what does it say to us? You know, it ha it, it speaks to us and tells yeah, us. Yeah, basically, stuff. it says, you know, go away. You know, this this is protected. You can't come here. Go away. And the goblin's telling the the giant to attack and to, to crush these foes. And yeah. And. Uh, there's a little bit of communication because the giant can understand human a little bit to a point. Yeah, and there's a bit of hesitation on the right. part of the giant to attack. Uh, you know, it's giving us a chance to to back away and run away before it, it starts attacking. And of course, that's in Delaney's realm a lot of times. Uh, enemies, you know, will sometimes give you a chance. It'll, they'll say, get out, leave us alone, get out of here. You know, a chance to back away, especially if the, if the enemy is someone, you know, really yeah. significant. And giants in my realm aren't, you aren't all good or all evil. It, giants are, are their own whatever. Yeah, own they could be good, they could be evil, they could be intelligent, they could be semi-intelligent, who knows. You know, it's just one of those things where we had the chance to back away. But it didn't quite work out that way because our barbarian failed her save. Right, it's a stressful situation yeah. and she fails her, her rage, yeah. her berserk. Yep. And she goes to Berserk and charges up on the hill. And Rolf is like, yeah! <laughs> Not Rolf, Frostolf. Frostolf, Their yeah. fighter, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm ready to go fight. So he, he charges up right along with her. Yep. And battle ensues. Oh my goodness. And Maud, uh, Maud actually kills the goblin. Yeah. Targets the goblin yeah. and he kills it yeah, Maud, pretty quickly. Uh, kids, Which is a good thing arrows. because the goblin actually knows uh, arcane magic. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's low... It's not high level enough, and he's pretty weak, and she manages to kill it. The goblin now has been sitting on top of the giant's shoulder, whispering in its ear, telling it stuff. And we're able, Maud is able to shoot it and knock it off. And I think, actually, from looking at my journal, Berger ran up and coup de grace it. But it was actually knocked off and was bleeding out yeah. by a bunch of Maud's arrows. I mean, it's a, it's a target. You know, and Maud is getting really good with her bow. And... She sees it sitting there, makes a couple really good bow shots. Goblins don't have a whole lot of hit points. It gets hit a couple times, knocked off. It's laying there kind of... Uh, 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 uh. Berger runs up. He's our scout, thief, uh, person. Rogue. Rogue runs up. Coup de grace it. At that time, combat is ensuing on the giant. Uh, you've got the barbarian. Yeah, you've, you've got, got Rosari. You've got, you've got Frostolf. Rosari, you've got Frostolf. They're hacking away at this giant. It doesn't know what's going on. It's armed with a giant plus one great club. And I don't think it makes a hit on anyone. No, it doesn't actually make a hit. And Frostwolf actually gets a lucky hit. Yeah. 
and gets a critical. Yep. And in the critical, he actually kills it. Yep. And Frostwolf's nickname in in the game is Faux Cleaver. Yeah. And he at this point dubs himself Giant Slayer or Giant Killer. Giant Killer. Frostwolf <laughs> Giant Killer. Right. And he's he's happy to tell everybody how he killed a giant, and this is the sword that on did his it. own before even Rosari even got to, to to make a strike. Yeah, he I killed it. Yeah, I believe he he crits it really yeah, and, he, and he really it. chops it really good. Um, so he becomes a giant killer, Frostolf giant killer, and <clears throat> and there we are at this mound, and you know this one of the things is well this is one of the mounds we've been sent up the valley to investigate. What are we going to do when we get there? Well, there's different things to do. You know, we can examine the giant dolmen in the middle, or we can kind of examine the whole uh, the whole area and find out if there's a secret entrance that leads underneath it. But one interesting thing we find on the goblin now are three rune bones. Yeah, he he has three rune bones now. In in this adventure, there actually aren't. Uh, wizards or sorcerers. There's a class that is available that I call a rune caster. Mm -hmm. Rune casters do it through runes. And it's a very complex uh, class that I have for these people. And you don't actually memorize your spells per day per normal. Your spells are random based upon the runes that you pull out of your bag. Your bag right here. Right. right. So character rune that would play a, a rune caster would have to literally draw into their bag, mm -hmm. and that would be the spell that they could cast. Now, they have the option, well, I, that's the wrong spell, I'll throw it back in my bag. And they can keep doing that, but every time they do that, that slows them down yeah. <clears throat> from casting their spell. Yeah, They can actually cast higher level spells off the rune, but it's weaker, and it may cause devastating things if they do it. Now, you said, I remember when you were coming up with the class of rune caster. Uh, it's kind of an original character mm -hmm. or original class for this game you said there were some advantages one you get you actually get uh more um, extra meta magic meta magic feats you get that but there was also one where you got more spells or you less get, spells but they were more powerful no you can actually get a few more spells but for example if uh let's say uh you find a rune of fireball okay and a fireball is a fifth level you have to be minimum 5th level okay. to cast it. All and right. when you cast it, it's 3d6 damage. Half if you make the save. Yeah. And as a rune caster, if you're 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th level, you find a, uh, a rune that's a fireball rune. You can actually cast it. It's weaker, so you won't do as much damage. But based upon your level, it may go off and cause it's chaos okay. in its own in its own realm. Okay, and it's magic that's imbued into these, uh, into whether it's bones or teeth or claws that that Something people have carved into. Right. Yeah. You know whether yeah. it be knuckle bones of fingers mm -hmm. or yeah. or tooth bones of of a bear or of a uh, shadow cat or yeah. or a dragon or whatever. A, Tips of bones from from certain uh, wild animals, mm -hmm. you know, antlers that they've cut off. Uh, wolf whale. Wolf whale is like an orca in my my world. So teeth like that that they carve it in and they enchant, and that's yeah. This is where the spell is drawn from. It's not drawn from your magic your your spell book. It's drawn through these runes, and you can have more than one spell, so you can actually have five or six magic missiles runes in your bag. There you go. So, and as long as you can keep pulling them, you're not memorizing them. So if, let's say, a wizard has, well, I'm going to memorize magic missile for the day, and I'm going to ma memorize uh, uh, invisibility, and I'm going to memorize this. A rune caster doesn't do that. A rune caster pulls their spell, and whatever it is, that... It is. That's the spell that they can cast. There so it's a lot more random, and it's a lot more chaotic. Yeah. And they can choose not to do that. They can choose to actually memorize their spells. But in doing so, then they lose how many spells they get to cast today. So it's yeah. it's lessened. So yeah, that's, that's so it's an advantageous thing by by using the runes and using this random yeah. wild uh, chaos. Because arcane magic is chaos in yeah. this time of my world. 
Yeah, I remember when we were talking about creating this class and you came up with the whole idea. And it's based upon, you know, how the old Vikings and Celts... Yeah, they would throw, would the, throw the bones. Yeah, throw the bones, yeah. Um, how you, when you came up with this idea that you were going to create this class that essentially was going to be more powerful than a regular magic user, but there was always going to be this wild aspect to it, this right. random aspect, you know, that you would either get what you wanted or you wouldn't get what you wanted. And the really interesting thing about that, and, and even in Pathfinder, is that you can create these situations and these characters, you know, because Pathfinder as a, as a system is expansive enough to absorb something like this, you know, to absorb wild magic, to absorb mm -hmm. rune casting, all that. You know, there's enough room within the, 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 path fan, the, the, the Pathfinder, you know, universe to where you can put a character like in like that in there, and it would actually function just perfectly well as a magic yeah. user. Yeah. So it's an interesting class that nobody has uh, has picked. Or, well, actually, uh, Thomas, who picked the witch, had the option of playing a runecaster, but decided yeah. to play the witch. Yeah. Because yeah. the witch has some arcane effects to it. Yeah. I mean, what can you do? Right. So with that, I think we're going to end this episode yeah. of Wizards of the Tower. Role playing. Campaign Tales, Episode 9. Now may all your adventures be epic. And keep on role-playing. Thanks, folks.